When I was a child, my father showed me a picture of the Earth taken from the space. This is a blue marble picture. And at that moment, I find it so impressive and also bring a lot of peace. And that was my first spark. And since then, I have been always fascinated about space. And uh, this is also what we do in Earth observation by chance. So we have the Earth, and the satellite is orbiting the Earth, taking the measurements. And the Earth itself is also rotating. And in such a manner, we will be able to make the measurements of the Earth's surface on a global scale, and also in very high resolution for any specific geolocation. And today, we are living at a big data era of Earth observation data. So if you look at the relevant satellite missions, and on the screen you see the situation of five years ago, and this is the situation of today and tomorrow. And you see that there are a lot of satellites already in orbit and it's about to come. And we are very well served with data till 2030. And in the European Space Agency, plans for 2040 is already under discussion. And among all these satellites, Terra's X and Tanner X, the first two, are the German uh, x band radar satellites. I will come back to this later. And the game changer is in this is a Sentinel satellite fleet from ESA. They have the open and free data policy. And basically every day, 15 petabyte, uh, terabytes of data are becoming available to everybody, also in this room. And here today is already 20 petabytes data there. And you can imagine, we can do many things which was not possible before with this data. And today, I'm going to share one data science story with satellite data of my own. It's the global urban mapping. So we are providing crucial information for two important sustainable development goals from the UN. One is no poverty, and the other one is the sustainable cities and community. I think it's clear for everybody in this room, urbanization is uh, the second biggest important mega trend of global changes after climate change. And if you look at the evolution of population in rural and urban area over the time, you will see that there is actually a secret change of human history in 2008. There are more people living in cities than in the rural areas. And if you look at the prediction in 2050, there are much more people that are eventually all living in cities. And now, if we look at the geospatial distribution of urban growth, and on the screen you see blue, dark blue is more well-established megacities, and the bright blue is the newly coming megacities, you can easily see that urban growth are mostly happening in the developing areas, Africa, South America, and Asia. And urbanization, if it's not well controlled, this will lead to informal settlements and slums. And without appropriate management, this could actually endanger the life of people who are living there. And i show you one recent example. So um, in Mumbai, in the past 10 years, more than 50,000 fires happened in this city. And about 67% of these fires are actually caused by the 40 virus. And you can imagine, if we want now to turn this kind of informal settlement to formal, and the first thing we need is information. Unfortunately, if you took at another example, this is Lagos, an Africa city with 21 million people. For this city, we even don't have a 3D model of the city. And I guess, today, what is available on a global scale? This is exactly what you see on the screen. Dark means urban, white means non-urban. This is the so-called global urban footprint. And you can imagine this is far from sufficient, right? You probably get shocked by the fact. This was exactly what happened to me four years ago. And I was saying, well, with Earth observation, we can do something better. And together with my team, 
uh, we are exploiting different types of satellite data. We combine them even with the social media data. And what we want to do is on a global scale to get the 3D shapes of buildings, get the evolution over the time, and we want to get the functions of the buildings so that you can find residential slums. And if we combine the 3D information and functions, we can also get a transparent calculation of the population density capacity. And the fact is, in some population density are extremely underestimated. How do we do that? The methodology is straightforward. Using radar satellite, we will get the 3D shapes of the buildings. And with multi hyperspectral satellite from the top, we will get the roof material. And complementarily, we can take the social media data. So taken from the street level, uh, tells me information of the building facades. And furthermore, we can even analyze the tweets sending from a specific geolocation. And then we will understand the activities in a certain building. And in this way, we can also get the functions of the buildings. And this is the idea. And the only difference here is that we don't do it for one building. We want to do it for every building on the Earth. And we are eventually dealing with 10 petabytes of data. To give you an idea how much data it is, you see a live video of the German remote sensing data archive, uh, which are taking orders from the users. 10 petabytes data actually means half of the archive. And how do we get 3D building shapes from radar satellite? I first would like to introduce you our satellites the first one is the Terrasa X satellite. This is a German X-band radar satellite, 11 years old, still healthy. We are very proud that it still delivers the radar images with the highest spatial resolution. And this is how it looks at Berlin, so radar image of Berlin. Probably you cannot see much information from such an image, even though, for me, as a radar expert, it's really so beautiful. <laughs> but you don't have 3D information. In particular, because radar is looking to the side, basically you see all the buildings are falling down to the ground. And to overcome this, the technology we use is the so-called radar tomography. And it's also called the X-ray of the Earth. The idea is that every 11 days, the satellite will visit the same spot, let's say Berlin, again, and take image from slightly different position. And each of these images could be considered as a tomographic slice of the Earth. And after you getting 30 of these images, let's say over a time period of a year, you can do the CT of the Earth, get the full 3D reconstruction. And what's more important here is that if we are talking about 30 images, it's taking in a time period of a year. This means we can also see what has been changed in this time period, in the fraction of the wavelengths, which is in the millimeter and the centimeter region. And today I will guide you through a tomographic tour of Berlin. And here is in 3D. Color stands for the height from blue to red is low to higher height. You see the post plots. You can see the Reichstag. You, can, you will also be able to see the Berlin Central Railway Station. And we're getting a point density of one million points per kilometer square. My favorite example is the Zig Zoiler. If you look along the roads, you see these kind of regular rasters. They're actually non poles along the roads. So for this city, we get 120 million points. Don't forget about the fourth dimension. We see the changes. You might want to know which kind of change we saw, right? So you know that from summer to winter, temperature will change. Building will also breathe. They will expand in summer and shrinks in winter. And this is what we can see with the satellite. And this is the Berlin Central Railway Station. And the deformation is actually in the region of millimeter to centimeter. In order that you can see it, it's exaggerated for a thousand times. But what you can observe is that the main building is breathe in this way. However, if you look at the railway sections, because of the clearance built, allow thermal dilation, it's this horizontal movement. 
And we are getting this information for every of these 120 million points I showed you before. And please imagine, we are now seeing the deepest secret of the cities from 500 kilometers away. Well, this is done with 30 of images and with half meter resolution. But it's not yet global. If we want to go to global scale, we need to take a compromise. We switch to the 10x mission. Here you see how the mission covers the Earth in every year, and we are the difference compared to the previous case. We are dealing with data with three meter resolution instead of half meter. We don't have 30 images, we only have a couple, several of them. Then we really need a sophisticated data science approach. And what we do is, with this small number of images through the so-called X-ray of the Earth, we can get the building height estimation, and we can take optical data, for instance, the planet data, which is also global, through, in this case, conditional generative adversary networks, we will get the building shape. And if we combine these two information together, today I have the honor to show you the first imp impression of the global 3D models. And this is the case of Munich, with the building height estimation better than two meters. And this type of information you will also get it in every Africa city in three years. Now, we want to know the functions of the building. Towards this goal, what we are doing is to get the global local climate zones classification. And this uh, is a classification scheme with 17 classes, uh, originally designed for the urban climatology, but the first 10 classes are describing the morphological structure of urban uh, structures. Height, compactness, uh, percentage of green, it's not directly the building functions, but it's towards that goal. Because you can imagine if we have high-rise compact, this is probably the commercialized area, right? And if you look at, for instance, lightweight, low-rise, you may think of this as most probably the slums, where we are very much interested in. And we are using a combination of convolutional and recur recurrent neural networks for this work. And uh, known to everybody, the first thing we need to have is the training data. So basically, a group uh, of 15 people from my team, including myself, we have been enabling 42 cities across 10 different cultural zones for one month. You know, this is a really interesting experience. After one month, when I was on business travels, before landing, I saw a lot of high-rise high compact sparse rebuilt. And uh, after we get these labels, we also let uh, 10 experts to give a vote. So to make sure the starting point of our global map is in very high quality. And on the stars, you see the cities we did the labeling. And in green are the about 1,700 cities with population more than 300,000, according to UN, where we're already processed. And in the near future, we will have it on a global scale. And last part is probably most relevant for everybody because in Germany we have a lot of privacy discussions about social media data. I want to show you how we can actually use them for social good. So the things we did is that from the satellite data we can get the building shapes and we connected a library contains more than 10,000 of this kind of street view images with building facades with a function, commercial, residential. And then we can throw it into a classifier, could be a deep learning algorithm. You will end up with this kind of building function classification. In this case, it's Chicago, Vancouver, and Munich. And my dream in four years is that we will be able to deliver the first and the consistent 3D, 4D spatial data on urban morphology. Go to any city, like the Mumbai I just mentioned as an example. We will be go far beyond what we have today. It's the binary mask of urban and the non-urban. We will know exactly where the slums are. 
if anything happens in a specific slum, we will also be able to get the 3D models of the slum and also the population density. And we are doing open science. We will make this data accessible to everybody, and we hope to lead to a better understanding of the global urbanization process. We want to provide this data to the stakeholders like the UN to help them to make strategic decisions. And the most important, really lying in my heart, is that we want to contribute to address the poverty problem. We hope the authority can get this kind of information, which helps them to better plan the infrastructures like clean water, healthcare, and education. And in the near future, we hope to make a difference. Thank you.